Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm John Lieber, um, and I'm going to be talking uh, about um, really I'm focusing on the gastric emptying and intestinal absorption, which is the area of which I got uh, some experience in. First of all, though, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, the European Hydration Institute and specifically uh, Ron for uh, the kind invitation to attend this very interesting, I'm sure, um, meeting. And, um, also for the opportunity to present uh, this short talk. Um, for most people, um, the alimentary tract is where water comes in. Um, we lose water daily, and we have got to re replace that, that water loss. And for the majority of us, we ingest more fluid than we actually need, and we excrete the, the extra uh, over it. The majority of intake is really dependent on habit for most people. If you change their environment, change that habit, they sometimes become dehydrated. Um, but there are various uh, things that will help uh, encourage people to drink. Uh, one is, oops, sorry. One is obviously taste of the drink. So the alimentary tract itself, uh, it's a conduit uh, for the intake of, of fluids. Um, there are receptors in the upper part of the tract that encourage drinking, uh, taste, dry mouth, as my mouth is very dry at the moment, and throat, um, sticky saliva, those sort of issues encourage people to drink. Um, there are receptors in the tract that um, meter the water fluid intake from individuals. It's not quite decided how that, how that works uh, fully, but in doing that, there the, the effect of satiety is triggered. Gastric fullness also is a potent uh, satiety response. Now, further along in in the gut, uh, the actual conservation of water and electrolytes it occurs mainly in the small intestine, uh, with the jejunum and ileum being the main regions of uh, of conservation with the colon being mainly a functional reserve for most people. Ingesting fluids, um, they immediately go out, well, uh, quite quickly move into the, the stomach, which is effectively a reservoir. And at that point there, there's no real net water or solute absorption in the stomach. The material has got to move into the small intestine in order to be absorbed. Gastric emptying is a highly regulated uh, mechanism. It releases fluid and nutrients into the duodenum in a controlled manner. In the small intestine, where the absorption occurs, there are specific transporters that absorb the nutrients and electrolytes from the intestinal lumen. Water uptake, a passive process, and is dependent on the establishment of suitable osmotic gradients. These are some of the factors that are known to affect gastric emptying or not to affect it. Most of the, this information has been derived from intubation studies, where tubes passed into the stomach, and um, the, the rates of emptying have been um, measured. Volume is an important factor. Increasing the intragastric volume increases the rate of emptying up to a maximum capacity. And this capacity appears to be different for each individual. Increasing energy density of the beverages slows gastric emptying rate uh, quite considerably. And we can <coughs> note differences between uh, a 2% and a 6% uh, carbohydrate solution quite easily. Increasing osmolality of the beverages also decreases emptying rates, but the effect of osmolality is much less than that for energy density. Temperature has little effect because uh, the for most beverages, the collaboration time in the stomach is relatively short in a matter of a few minutes. Again, pH of beverage has little effect on emptying rates, again, because there's li limited buffering capacity in most, most drinks. Exercise um, can affect gastric emptying. Uh, low intensity uh, exercise does increase gastric emptying very slightly compared with um, uh, sitting sedentary um, emptying. 
Uh, steady state exercise uh, above 70% of VO2 max slows gastric emptying, but so does short and small amounts of high intensity intermittent exercise, which specifically uh, and measurably can slow emptying. As I say, most of these factors here have been derived using intubation techniques, but there are many other different techniques that have been used. Um, uh, validation has been quite difficult for quite a few of them. They, I wouldn't say that most of them have been properly validated. But having said that, most methods can be used to make comparisons between beverages using the same subjects and the same methodology. The uh, between subject variability in gastric empty measurement is quite high, it's about 30% in most um, uh, studies that have, have looked at this here. But if you look at the within subject variability, it's much less, around about 10%. Moving on to the uh, small intestine where the absorption occurs, um, it's the structure of the small intestine is such that it is designed quite well for um, uh, absorption. It's a large absorptive structure. Um, with the villi increasing the this, this surface volume. Um, there's a single layer of columnar uh, cells, the enterocytes, that line the surface of the villi. So, you know, limits the, the, um, um, uh, the delay in transferring um, uh, material that has, been, uh, that has been absorbed. The microvilli increase the absorptive surface. Um, they are on the apical surface of the villi. But more importantly, probably, is the fact that the digestive enzymes, the main digestive enzymes, are bound to the microvilli. Um, they break down the complex uh, uh, nutrients, making smaller molecules that are more easily absorbed. And structurally quite close to these digestive uh, enzymes are nutrient transport carriers of different specificities um, that translocate the, uh, the, the um, nutrients across the enterocyte membrane. There is also modifiable intercellular tight junctions between the enterocytes, which allows um, water and some solutes to pass through. There's a rich, rich blood supply with extensive network of capillaries just below the epithelial, epithelial cells of the villus, uh, which allows movement of the uh, absorbed material rapidly into the circulation. The main uh, uh, transporters, uh, they're carrier mediated, um, they are, as I say, microvilli bound, and they translocate the solute from the lumen to the enterocyte site salt. Um, these carriers are specific to individual molecules or to molecules of a similar structure. There are active transporters that use the ect electrochemical potential of cations, and in humans, it's mainly sodium that's cation that's used. And I've given the example here as the sodium-dependent glucose transporter, SGLT1. There is also diffusional uh, facilitated transporters, uh, such as GLUT5, which is uh, the, the main carrier for fructose. These are energy and sodium independent, um, although, well, I should say it was cation independent, but uh, in humans it's sodium independent. But they are concentration dependent. And although the uptake using these facilitated transports is faster than simple diffusion, it's much slower than active transport mechanisms. There's also electrically neutral ion exchange mechanisms and ion cotrans systems cited in the enterocyte membrane, which allows for um, uh, electrolyte absorption. The important thing to remember is that water absorption is a passive or mainly a passive consequence of the establishment of suitable osmotic gradients that drive the uptake of water from the lumen uh, across the enterocyte. Uh, and the osmotic gradients are uh, produced, right, are produced um, by the active uptake of nutrients and, so and, and sodium um, that produce the greater osmotic gradients um, in man. Facilitated uptake is, also, is less effective than active co-transport because there's more um, uh, osmotically active um, molecules that are trans transferred uh, and they are fa transferred faster. But if all the active uptake uh, carriers are, are activated, then facilitated uptake may be a given additional uh, effect. Aquaporins are the integral membrane pore proteins that act as highly efficient water channels. 
and in man, the, the aquaporin AQP10 is um, uh, concentrated in the um, uh, apical cells of the, of the villi, um, and they effectively help um, the water uptake um, along the osmotic gradients. And these aquaporins in some isoforms may also allow the uptake of some solutes. Water and solute can also pass between the enterocytes, between the tight junctions, and this is because the perijunctional actomycin ring in these junctions is activated, uh, it can be activated to increase or decrease the permeability. Um, uh, th such things as, as glucose uh, and um, actively transported amino acids um, activate uh, this response and increase the permeability, allowing water flow by osmos osmosis through the tight junctions, and along with that, some solute is thought to be carried through also. Looking at factors that affect gastric, and gastric intentional absorption, um, the, most, of the most of these factors have been identified using steady-state perfusion techniques, where a tube is passed into a section of the small intestine. Uh, steady-state um, uh, conditions are established along that segment of gut. Um, and uh, they look at uh, the effect uh, of, of altering the beverage um, or well, the perfusion fluid um, materials in order to look at the um, effect of, on absorption. Gastric emptying rate is obviously an important one. Um, increasing the rates of emptying uh, increases uh, intestinal absorption. Osmolality, moderate hypotonicity in the lumen appears to enhance water uptake, as might be expected, but strangely enough, it looks as if the, the um, difference in hypertonicity uh, levels uh, is very small, and uh, osmolality between 200 and 260 milliosmoles per kilogram appear to be optimal in humans. Hypertonicity, uh, on the other hand, that is greater than about 300 milliosmoles per kilogram, decreases uptake uh, there, compared with isotonic solutions. Carbohydrate content um, is, is important with uh, the glucose-sodium uh, co-trans uh, promoting uh, water absorption, with fructose being less effective than that there. And the amino acids that are actively transformed, uh, transported are also uh, effective in, pr in uh, promoting water absorption. Some studies have shown that uh, a large amount of maltodextrin in the beverage uh, may assist water uptake because osmolality is much lower uh, per uh, unit amount of, of carbohydrate uh, using maltodextrins. Sodium concentration, one would think, would be an important factor uh, in active transport that's required, but it's not clear if sodium is really required in the drinks because the efflux of sodium into the upper part of the small intestine is usually so rapid that, at least in perfusion studies, um, it's not been shown to, uh, that um, sodium in the perfusion um, uh, material is required. Um, pH, it's unlikely that pH has any effect uh, because the intestinal buffering capacity, it's unlikely that uh, any beverage or perfusion solute would be um, uh, great enough to alter that buffering capacity. And again, temperature, it's unlikely that uh, drink temperature will affect luminal uh, uptake because it won't affect luminal temperature. Exercise, you can appreciate using uh, tubes that are inserted into people. It's quite difficult to do exercise in there. But uh, some studies have shown that steady state exercise at below 70% of VO2 max has little effect on intestinal absorption. But obviously, higher levels uh, and intermittent exercise would affect gastric emptying, which in turn would um, slow um, uh, intestinal absorption. As I say, the perfusion technique, steady-state perfusion, is the method that's been used uh, for, to identify these factors. And when these sort of methods, the between-subject variability is, again, quite high, it's about 22%, with within-subject variability the coefficient being around about 12% uh, or less. In order to try and uh, get a more naturally, uh, or, uh, a method that, that appears more natural to us, um, isotopic tracers for water have been used to try and look at the integrated response of gastric emptying and intestinal absorption by labelling drinks which are then ingested. Um, both deuterium oxide and tritium oxide appear to be appropriate tracers. This has been shown from about the 1950s. Um, they are 
odorless, tasteless, relatively safe, and more importantly, they are measurable. Um, the thing to remember is that isotopic te techniques don't determine the net rates of water absorption. Rather, the comparisons give you the relative rates of absorption of drinks between um, uh, solutions. And I'm suggesting that the unidirectional flux is the best measure um, uh, to use in this type of, of uh, experiments. The accumulation rate of water tracers in the circulation does appear to follow the integrated effects of both gastric emptying and intestinal absorption of these labelled drinks. The technique uh, has been shown to have a between subject variation of about around about 40%, which again is very high. Uh, the intersubject um, variance hasn't been really looked at uh, as yet. To show the effect of the integration of both gastric emptying and intestinal absorption, I put up this slide here of a study we did some years, years ago here, looking at three solutions um, with different, uh, the gastric emptying rate was measured using intubation method. I've used T half time here, the time taken to empty half of the ingested solution. Um, water absorption was, used, was measured using perfusion study and uh, deuterium accumulation uh, from labeled um, uh, drink and looking at the accumulation in the circulation to the maximum concentration. If we look at the three solutions, solution A emptied much faster than did solution B or C, which had uh, emptied at approximately the same rate. Water absorption was higher um, in the uh, solution A compared with solution B, which in turn was higher than solution C. So this gets rid of the gastric emptying effect. That's just uh, the, the absorption in the small intestine. Looking at the accumulation rate to maximum in the circulation, we can see that solution A, the accumulation rate was faster than it was for the other two solutions. It had a faster rate of gastric emptying, faster rate of uh, water absorption, and showed a faster rate of uh, deuterium accumulation. Uh, solution B showed a, fast rate, a faster rate of um, accumulation compared with C, and although the gastric emptying rates were similar, there was a difference of almost uh, twice twofold in the uh, water absorption, which suggests that the pattern of deuterium accumulation does indeed follow this integration of both gastric emptying and water absorption. And finally, I'd like to just finish with this slide here, um, which is a very complicated slide, but um, I'm only going to make two points here. Quite a few of the studies that have looked at um, typical uh, ab absorption f between solutions have used the area under the curve here over uh, two hours to three hours uh, there. The, um, the slope of accumulation in the circulation is the method I suggest is, is best used here. Ingestion of the solution, rapid rise of the uh, tracer into the circulation as influx from the lumen um, uh, into the circulation is high. It then levels off and then there's a drop in the concentration in that the, where the, the influx uh, from the lumen is less than the efflux out of the circulation into the total body water pool. And eventually it comes down to a steady state where the um, tracer has effectively equilibrated with the total body water pool and we can then measure the water pool there. But this response here, which is the fast response here, I think is the better method of measuring or comparing drinks because the um, area under the curve takes into account this huge area here where influx is um, um, less than the efflux. And I'd like to stop there if that's possible. Thank you. Thank you for making the chairman's job easy by sticking to time. It's uh, never good to have to tell speakers to stop, but you, you did very well as far as time. The two discussants for this, this paper are Susan Sheriffs and myself. Do you want to start, Susan? Um, can I ask you a little bit about energy density, osmolality, and the isotonicity? Because you mentioned both of those as... Uh, all of those being influ influencing gastric emptying and intestinal absorption. But I think I'm correct from your summary that most of our knowledge on that comes from carbohydrate. Yes, uh -huh, indeed. So 
how well can we take that information and say it will be similar or different if, if we're talking about proteins or fats or indeed solid foods that are contributing ultimately to our water intake, let's see. Uh, uh, I, I take your point. I mean, I, I must admit I focused on beverages uh, yeah. as such, but certainly there are um, at least three studies I can think of that looked at uh, amino acids or at least dipeptides, and they seem to have the same effect, that um, it's the energy density that seems to be more important. If you, if you make the same osmolality uh, using electrolytes, um, then you don't get the same um, the same effects. It's, it's slowing seems to be a measure of the energy density of the drink. I mean, I, again, I couldn't say anything about fats. I don't think that's really being looked at as such. I'm not aware of, of anything on fats. But certainly proteins and um, uh, carbohydrates seem to have a, an energy density effect rather than osmolality effect. How it's how it's, it's, it's measured, how it's, how it's done by the body, because most of this material, obviously, is, has not been absor absorbed. So how does it work? Um, I don't think we're at all clear about how, how that... I mean, there have been various suggestions that so much carrier gets um, activated in a certain length of gut, well, maybe that puts a feedback um, effect, but, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, speculation. At the moment. And, and just following on from that, on the hypotonicity issue then, so that 200 to 260 stimulating maximum water yeah. uptake, mm -hmm. that, I'm assuming from your, that your answer there then, that a significant amount of that tonicity contribution is from either the carbohydrate or protein rather than electrolytes. Will it be different if it's, let's say, just electrolytes that are making up that 200, 260? Yeah, well... I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, if you, if Nancy Rera did a, did a couple of studies in which she looked at um, using electrolyte solutions only, and the absorption rate from, from electrolyte solutions is, is quite slow, even though they're hypotonic. Although most of the things that she did was looking at isotonic solutions, but mm -hmm. some of them were indeed hypotonic. She, what she had a, in most of her studies was at least some carbohydrate mm -hmm. and then altered the the osmolality um, uh, using electrolytes, and certainly electrolytes had very little effect um, uh, on, on absorption there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just a general question on the title. Your title was um, about um, the role of this in hydration status, basically. Where do you see the gastrointestinal tract's importance relative to, say, other organs, renal system, and so on? I think it's... I mean, I would, I would have to say I see the alimentary tract as being very, very important for starts. It's where you st stick it all in. Um, but there's a whole variety of things. I think, I think gastric emptying and intestinal absorption, I think it's been shown in plenty of clinical studies that that's important. Um, um, having a stomach is, is really helpful as is having a reasonable length of gut, mm -hmm. uh, small intestine is, is very helpful. So I, you know, I think it's, it's part of the whole integrated uh, system of, of fluid control. For the majority of people, as far as I can see, they, they drink more than they actually need. And there is plenty of time. It's episodic um, drinking, uh, for most of us, anyway. And um, it, uh, it, it, uh, the gut holds... Uh, the drink, it allows slow release, slow hour release than if we were putting it intravenously. Uh, and I think it's beneficial. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Shall I carry on or do you want uh, to come? I, I could maybe dive in and ask a couple of ways. You, you highlighted a very large variability for all of the, the measurement techniques you described, gastric emptying, intestinal uh, absorption, and the, the deuterium tracer. And the, the variability was greater between subjects than it was within subjects, but it was still quite high within subjects. So we've got two separate things taking place. What do you think the difference between individuals is that accounts for that variability? Well, I, I, th I think there is genuine variability in gastric emptying rates in individuals, and it may come down to their, their methods of eating and drinking. Um, if I can cite John Robertson, um, who was a, uh, um, a postgrad in our department many years ago. Um, he was doing, he was involved, he, he wanted, he was quite a decent runner, 
He wanted to get into the London Marathon. Um, he was trying to make a time to get into the London Marathon. And we, being physiologists and very helpful, we encouraged him to drink heavily when he was running, get as much fluid into him as he could when he ran. And his times got worse and worse and worse. Um, so we then, um, we were doing a study in the, in the, in the, the department. Uh, most of the subjects we used were normally staff within, within the department and students. He volunteered for the gastric emptying. And whereas majority of people, when they ingest something, the gastric emptying rate uh, follows a negative exponential curve, he did nothing. He emptied nothing for almost an hour. And then everything just came shooting through out of the stomach. If you looked at his eating habits, he, was, he, he ate every hour. He went and he snacked the whole time throughout the day. He never actually sat down and had a meal that I ever saw. He just snacked. And he had the most strangest form of gastric emptying uh, pattern that I've ever seen. So I think people are different. And we're assuming that, uh, that it, this, this happens uh, in, when you're a baby, the, the amount of fluids, the amount of foodstuffs that go in, uh, it activates the carriers. And this mechanism is a, is a trained, is a, is a developed mechanism um, in the early stages of life because it's difficult to see how energy density can affect gastric emptying when that energy hasn't all been absorbed. So I'm assuming it's something like carriers that are activated, the number of carriers that are activated, the hormone responses that are triggered from that there, they all are integrated into, into developing uh, the rate at which each individual empties. But, I mean, I think for a between subject variability of around about 12%, I think that's pretty good um, uh, in it. It's not quite as good as using a glass bottle and uh, doing the experiment in a glass bottle, but I think 12% is a pretty reasonable um, level of, of variability from day to day. And it, and it may be that even that variability is, is due to what the person ate the day before, or the day before that, um, uh, affecting the, the so, response. So to what extent do you think it's trainable? If you have somebody who's a, a slow gastric emptier, who's a slow uh, intestinal absorber, can they do anything to speed up that hydration process? Um, the two experiments that I've, I've seen where people have tried to train um, the gut, the stomach, um, showed no difference. We did a, did a study in which people drank a sports drink um, each day. They drank a large volume of it each day. The gastric emptying rate had been measured uh, before they started this. They then uh, drank a litre of sports drink um, throughout the day, um, taking most of it in the evening. Um, and there was no change in gastric emptying rate over four weeks of this sort of training. What did happen was that they, they especially the women in the, in the study, they um, found it less difficult to drink. They could drink it faster, um, and they didn't get the same huge uh, response to uh, gastric fullness. And Asker Jugendrup's group also did a study using water, taking large volumes of water over uh, a period, and there was no training effect. Um, seen there either. So it seems to occur, if it does occur, it occurs in, 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 uh, as a baby rather than uh, as an adult. Yeah. But we know with, with animal models you can induce intestinal transporters in adult life. If you take um, sheep, for example, they've been weaned and feed them lactose, mm -hmm. you will induce yeah. the, the lactase enzymes Enzyme. and you will induce yeah. the transporters. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, the gut can adapt even later in life. Uh, uh, yes, um, and certainly, I mean, studies in humans have shown that if you increase the, the carbohydrate intake uh, of individuals, they will absorb more quickly that carbohydrate, uh, specifically, and again, with, with fats and with proteins. Yeah. Uh, and it's very, but it's very specific for uh, whatever you've used um, uh, to, to increase uh, uh, yeah, the, the you mentioned metering of water intake with oropharyngeal receptors, and you alluded briefly there to, to, to uh, you, you said you didn't think it was likely you could monitor the carbohydrate. But we know there are carbohydrate receptors in the mouth, yeah. and a number of studies in the last 10 years or so have looked at putting a carbohydrate drink in the mouth, swirling it around for a few seconds, spitting it out, and it definitely sends signals to the brain because the MRI studies show 
uh, regions of the brain lighting up, mm -hmm. and performance, exercise performance is enhanced. Yeah. So yeah. do you think when you normally drink, it passes through the mouth too quickly? I would say yes, because in most of the studies there, they, they spend some time rinsing their mouth uh, with it. Um, but but it's, it's, it certainly is a fair point. I mean, it may be that up, further up um, in the mouth, in the pharyngeal area, perhaps, um, people the, tell us to swallow those drinks quickly so we don't erode our teeth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then my mother told me I should chew my food 47 times or something before Always swallowing. believe I your mother. keep it in the mouth. Uh, but we, we seem to be giving people conflicting advice. Yes. On the one hand, we're saying drink quickly so you get these things away from your teeth and help look after your teeth. On the other hand, we're saying drink slowly so there's time for the physiological effects Excellent. to be apparent and potentially reduce intake. I mean, cleaning teeth doesn't take very long, does it? And it's pretty cheap, so I would say take it slowly and then clean your teeth afterwards. <laughs> Not always very practical. Dentists actually say clean your teeth beforehand. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, get the bugs up. Yeah. I, so, so you need to be a bit careful. I had a professor of surgery who told me that he always washed his hands before he went to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> But then, then, then the, the people who are interested in looking at, at nitrate as a mediator of some of the reactions tell you not to clean your teeth <laughs> because you kill the bugs and the bugs convert the nitrate to nitrite, which gives you some of the beneficial effects. So whatever advice we give, somebody comes along and says that's the wrong advice. A, a couple more quick points from me before we move on. Um, you said you didn't think temperature was very important from a gastric emptying point of view, but there used to be lots of reports in the literature that if people drank large volumes of very cold drinks, they got a gastric dumping syndrome, which I've never seen or experienced, but you still see it in some of the textbooks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a fallacy. I don't know how it came about. I mean, we, we looked at uh, these uh, ice slurries um, and people taking uh, where we had um, a thermometer in, in, the, in the stomach. People taking fairly large amounts of these ice slurries, about 600 mils, within three minutes, the, the temperature of the stomach was above 30 degrees centigrade. You know, I mean, there was, a, there was an immediate drop, but it came back up very, very quickly. And when we looked at even things like blood flow in the, in the arm, um, no effect whatsoever taking fairly large amounts of these slurries, which have got you know, reasonable uh, thermal capacity uh, in them. But w where temperature maybe does become important is where you need to drink a lot. If you're physically active in hot environments and you need to drink fairly large volumes, it's difficult to drink large volumes of cold drinks. I, I, I would agree, um, but I, I, I don't think it's a temperature effect as such. I mean, um, in that, the, the, I think if you looked at the temperature in the stomach minutes afterwards, then it's, it would be pretty near normal core temperature mm -hmm. but it may be that in taking the cold drinks immediately you get that response which gives you the, the splitting headache and, and, and responses like that. that uh, not not just the splitting headache, when we, when we try to get athletes <coughs> to drink two or three litres of, of drinks at four degrees centigrade straight out of a, a, uh -huh. a machine that dispenses them at four degrees, they couldn't do it. When we let the drinks warm up to 10 or 12 or 15 degrees, they could happily drink the same volume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think too much cold Maybe can bad. be counterproductive if you want to drink large volumes. Well, certainly one of the studies we did in Loughborough where we were looking at gastric emptying and the, these individuals drank 500 mils and then they had to drink 300 mils every 15 minutes. I mean, that had no effect on gastric emptying whatsoever and they, they took the drink straight out of the cold um, the, in the, the ice baths. Um, that were used there. But yeah, perhaps if you're talking about litres, um, perhaps that is yeah. a, um, yeah. a, a water. Well, last, last comment from me. Um, given that most people take drinks together with food, um, I might suggest all of this stuff is completely irrelevant because as soon as you mix the drink with the food, the composition that changes, changes and therefore yeah. the gastric emptying mm -hmm. becomes completely different, the intestinal absorption becomes completely different. And in most cases, you probably, rather than getting a, a hydration in the immediate aftermath, you, you get, get a dehydration yes. because yes. you get a net secretion mm -hmm. into the gut. And that's something that people don't seem to be aware of, the fact that if you take something that's strongly hypertonic, in the short term, you'll secrete water into the gut. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would totally agree. Um, I suppose I've come from an area of uh, sports drinks where people don't eat um, uh, during exercise that they, they drink. But yes, I mean, the, 
Um, it's, there's no doubt about it that uh, the presence of, of food, particulate matter, slows gastric emptying and therefore <coughs> slow intestinal absorption. And for most of us, that's the way we, we take our fluids. We take it along with food, whether it's tea in a biscuit or, or whether it's a meal with a glass of water or a glass of wine. Um, and how, lo how long do you think that effect lasts? Because most of the, the stuff in the literature, whether gastric emptying or intestinal perfusion, has been done after an overnight fast. Yes. Would you get the same results if you did it, say, three hours post-absorptive, when some of the residue of that food is certainly still going to be in the GI tract? I, I mean, I think the, the answer to that, would, uh, my feeling would be yes, and it would depend how much... Uh, was in the stomach, how much was in the intestinal tract. But, but certainly, I mean, it would change the osmolality, it would change um, the viscosity, uh, it would change so many different things yes. um, that, would, that would bound to affect intestinal absorption. Yeah. Susan, do you have any more questions before we open up the discussion? Um, just a quick question about the colon, because um, you had a mention mm -hmm. up there that it's a uh, um, functional reserve, possibly its main function. And I think from your manuscript, you had numbers around the lines of maybe something like 600 mils reaches there a day, 400 something like that, absorbed, yeah, that, yeah. but it could have a, a capacity of two to three litres? Yes, uh -huh, yes. Um, Do we know a lot about it? Not How an awful lot. is that um, based on? Um, I mean, it's, it's that, most of that information is based on um, studies that were carried out in the 50s and 60s, okay. um, but there have been um, a couple of studies that uh, Ralston and that group, Mike Farthing's group, did, uh, where they did um, uh, they washed out the whole of the intestine and uh, then looked at absorption rates in different segments. And uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the colon obviously can absorb uh, quite a lot, quite rapidly um, uh, fluids, but um, the, f the 400 to 600 is information that was gleaned way back in, I think, early 60s. Um, most of that was there. So, you know, uh, no one's looked at it uh, recently. Um, yeah. And a, a field of experimental endeavor, I would think, uh, in that there, yeah. I, I seem to recall studies from the American military looking at putting rehydration in via the rectum. Via rectum, when yes. When clean water wasn't available yeah, and yeah, perhaps yeah. the gut wasn't I mean, fully functional. there's no doubt about it. The, the colon can absorb, I mean, the, the cholera, um, um, work that was done by uh, way back in the 1800s where they, they threw up a couple of gallons of water up and then put in a, uh, a cork or a leather bung into the anus, yeah, I mean. Um, so, yes, I mean, the, the colon is, is perfectly capable of absorbing quite large volumes, but what volume actually goes in normally into the, the colon per day um, is perhaps um, uh, a little bit of conjecture. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. <coughs> it's open now for discussion. If you want to stick your hand up and dive in. John, all other things being equal in terms of temperature, pH, solute load, what about the, the timing of ingestion during physical activity? And I'm thinking in terms of many small gulps of fluid versus periodic larger boluses if you uh, want to deliver something into the, the bloodstream? Well, uh, I mean, certainly um, the, the, the fuller the stomach, the faster the emptying rate uh, will be. And uh, whether there's a large volume in there which you keep topping up uh, would perhaps be the best method of, uh, of doing it rather than trying to pour a rather large volume into the stomach. Because if you're exercising and... and slopping around, um, it can be quite difficult um, to um, uh, do your best when you've got a full stomach, um, depending on exercise. Cycle exercise is obviously easier than, than running exercise. Cycling or, or skating exercise seems to be, the gl that gliding effect seems to be uh, uh, less uh, of a problem uh, with, with gastric fullness. So, I mean, um, it's, it's, I, th I think each athlete has got to work out the best rehydration strategy they've got during exercise, um, and probably pre and post as well. But I mean, um, I don't think as many people can exercise really hard with a full stomach. Uh, there obviously are some, but uh, I think it's limited in that. 
Joe, could I ask you first of all about the age of the people in which these studies have been done? My guess is it's probably lab, predominantly lab volunteers. And the context of my question is a clinical one, which is that we spend a lot of time looking after older people who are recovering from severe illness, may not be a GI illness, but they're nutritionally challenged, and we spend a lot of time giving them protein, energy, su liquid supplements to try and reinforce their nutrition. So my question is whether there are any lessons we might learn about how we should best administer that in order to get them to absorb it, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crucial part of our management strategy mm -hmm. to try and help these people recover. Yeah. Um, good question. Um, certainly, majority of the studies that have, have looked at gastric emptying and intestinal absorption relatively young people. Uh, we've used some subjects who are in their uh, 30s, but the majority would probably have been, you know, 18 to 25 uh, type of age. I don't, I can't think of any studies off the top of my head that have looked at people, you know, 50 plus. Um, I think using isotopic tracer would be an ideal method for, for doing it, um, because there are only certain people who you can intubate comfortably, um, especially with the perfusion tube. But an isotopic method, uh, I think, would, uh, could be used uh, in, in uh, older people. Um, and being one of the older people, um, maybe I should volunteer. Um, but I'm not aware of any studies that have specifically looked at older people. Um, we know the thirst response is, is um, ablated slightly and we, we, we know the kidneys don't function quite as well. I know that as a personal fact. Um, and I, I really can't think of any study that's, that, that's, that's looked at that there. And therefore, you know, it would be quite difficult to sort of be um, positive about methods one could use to look at people, especially people who are ill, um, uh, to drink. I mean, I, I can remember when I, I worked in a, a unit that was uh, part of the professorial surgical unit there, um, the encouragement that the nursing staff tried to uh, get people to drink, but it was mainly water and tea. That was the, the big thing uh, to, to get into them. It wasn't, uh, if anything else other than that, it went in IV uh, on it there. But you'll remember too, John, in that, in that surgical unit, we, we suggested that people might be able to tolerate oral fluids after surgery, after, whereas yep. the surgeons all said, once you've had a general anaesthetic, forget it, it has to be IV fluid, and I'm sure Ahmed will have some experience there. We found that people could tolerate oral fluids perfectly well, so the gut was very functional, even very soon after major surgery. Can we crystallize my question a bit more, and I, th I think I may know the answer, which is that we don't know. But um, if you're, so you've got an older person, they're ill, their gut works, in front of them is their trade name, Forty Juice, or whatever you might be. Uh, do we tell them to glug it very slowly over four hours, a sip at a time? Are they better to try and get it down quickly? Do we have any information about what will maximize absorption of nutrient or fluid in that setting? Well, what, what I would say is if you, if you take the, the effect of cholera, uh, what they've, they, um, in, in the developing countries there, what they have used is a SIP technique um, throughout the day where, where either the patient or a helper has teaspoon by teaspoon uh, fed the same. And that seems to be very, very effective given that you've got the time uh, to take it in. And in today's um, NHS, you can still bang in a an IV just to make sure people are well hydrated. And then I would suggest that it would be a, a steady sip, sip. The difficulty being that if the, if the patient can't sip it, you're not going to get a nurse, nurses spending the time making sure that they, that they will get that fluid in. So in that instance then, it might have to be glug it down quickly. You know, and you're more likely to get people vomiting in that situation there. I think in illness, um, as a general thing, I think in illness and in trauma, it's the stomach that is the weak point. That's the bit that seems to get most upset. Uh, some of the studies that I've put in, in, in my re review paper, um, they showed that for the uh, people who had been injured in, in the Korean War, if you got a tube into the small intestine and put fluids into there, they were absorbed reasonably well. Uh, it was the stomach that seemed to be the, the major problem um, uh, there, um, the, the weak point. 
You'll come to Ibrahim and then to Phil. I think you had your hand up after that. Well, <coughs> sorry. T two short questions. So the one is the influence of alcohol, uptake of uh, water uh, from alcoholic drinks. Is it facilitated? Is it uh, less? Um, depending on the alcohol content, but certainly if you have uh, dilute alcohol um, drinks, they seem to be absorbed quickly. Um, the, I don't think there is the same asthmatic effect produced by the alcohol uh, being absorbed um, as there is from carbohydrates or proteins. Um, but you seem to get fairly, I mean, it's, it's at least as good as water, um, uh, it would appear. And, and people can hydrate using dilute alcohol uh, drinks. And they very happily um, seem to be able to hydrate uh, in that situation there. Perhaps if they have some crisps along with it, so they've got a little bit of carbohydrate and protein, and a little bit of salt, that maybe help it as well. Independent of the temperature of the drink? I, I, I mean, I, I don't think for most beverages, temperature is, is uh, a big effect, has a big effect on um, gastric emptying or intestinal absorption. Um, if you had something with a fairly high thermal capacity and you were drinking far large volumes of it, then that's going to have an effect. As Ron was saying, that they had some problems with athletes who were being asked to drink one to two litres of a very cold drink. Um, uh, then they, they found it quite difficult to, to drink that sort of volumes that cold. Um, uh, I don't have any experience with that, that sort of volumes, but for... Volumes of around about 600 mils, it doesn't seem to be um, uh, that difficult to do um, for individuals. Uh, I, I tend to link the absorption or uptake of fluids to the requirements, the water requirements, the fluid requirements. I, I wouldn't Is, say that's... No? That, that, no. I, I mean, most of us drink more than we need to drink. Uh, because we enjoy the taste or we are, we're into that habit of when we drink, um, you urinate out the, the excess as long as your kidneys are and bladder are in good condition. Okay, um, the, yeah, but the, this leads uh, to the uh, next question. Is there an optimal composition of the diet with regards to the water requirements? Not that I'm aware of, not as far as requirement is concerned. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's dependent on the water losses or at least the anticipated water losses if you want to maintain reasonably good hydration status. Um, but I think probably everyone here has got a slightly different habit of, of when, they, when they take in fluids, when they eat, how much, how much they take in. Um, uh, lots of people take... Um, in, in, in the general recommendations so for water, so for healthy people, we say around one mil per one calorie, kilo calorie. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's an arbitrary figure that uh, has yeah. got no... I mean, it's, it, it's come from epidemiological studies yeah. uh, suggesting that that's a reasonable amount, and it probably is what works out for the majority of people on yeah, a daily yeah, but, basis. But, but the energy we ingest is not only from carbohydrates, so we have a mixed diet. And yes, so yes, and uh, amino acids are equally as effective as a lot of the carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. What it's not particularly, what I'm not con um, particularly clear about is the effect of fats uh, mm -hmm. in that there, and that they are absorbed in a slightly different, different way and, and probably are not majorly responsible for, for producing those osmotic gradients that will allow water absorption. But equally, electrolytes are poured into the, the mm -hmm. small intestine and mm -hmm. the uptake of those electrolytes, being re the reuptake of these electrolytes and help water absorption. So fats, I'm not so sure about. Proteins and uh, carbohydrates have a positive response to water absorption. And, and salt? I, I, I mean, if, depending on the amount of salt lost, I mean, you must, uh, in order to maintain hydration, you must keep up reasonable salt levels um, in the body. But for the, the actual beverage or for the food, it doesn't necessarily need to have the salt there in order for water up uptake. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the salt has to be there. Otherwise, it's not going to be taken up and there's going to be major health problems 
if, there's, if um, we get a drop in, in even circulating sodium levels. Maybe just a comment on your, your previous point there, Ibrahim. If you, if you go from a, an environment like this to a hot environment, you can increase your body water losses by 50%, but your energy requirement doesn't change. If we take an athlete to a hot climate, they can perhaps have 50% higher energy requirement than yours, but their sweat loss may be five liters or six liters a day. So you can completely dissociate the water requirement from the energy requirement. It just so happens that for sedentary people in a temperate environment, it roughly works out you can rub along okay on one, one mil per calorie. But it doesn't work for active individuals and it doesn't work in hot climates. Yeah, but, but the energy requirements do not vary as much. Exactly. The energy requirement doesn't vary, but the water requirement varies hugely. So if that's true in a cool environment, it can't also be true in a hot environment. So, so it, it, it just happens to work in temperate climates, which is where most of us live. We had a question from Phil yeah. next, I think, and then Peter. And then Ian. I guess this leads on from Ron's uh, comment there. Carl Gazolfi's group showed that um, fairly hard exercise in hot environments can induce an, an increase in intestinal permeability. Um, is anything known about how that affects the delivery of water and, and carbohydrate or, or, or any macronutrient um, into the I, circulation? I mean, it, it didn't seem to affect anything in, in Carl's group uh, in their perfusion studies. The, the perfusion rates were as you would expect in, from that group there. So it, exercise in a hot environment didn't appear to, to do that there. But um, I mean, it, it is known that um, uh, lipopolysaccharide uh, can be found in the circulation of individuals who've run um, very hard um, uh, marathons, this would, um, which suggested that there was increased permeability and some materials such as E. coli were perhaps uh, getting across the, 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 the mechanical barrier of the, of the small intestine. So I think permeability uh, under stress whether it be exercise or exercise in heat stress, uh, will alter permeability. Um, but that, I couldn't see that slowing down water absorption, but uh, it may in fact increase um, the net absorption um, uh, given, a, uh, given that the tight junctions um, in between the, the columnar uh, cells do tend to become more permeable um, uh, when there is nutrients there and um, that are active, actively absorbed. And if, if overall permeability is increasing as well, then that would suggest there would be an increase in permeability uh, uptake, yeah. We have Peter and then Ian and then Richard. Thank you. Uh, may I go shortly back to the question of one milliliter for one kilocalories? Uh, from a pediatric point of view, we think always uh, for constant body weight, constant circumstances, but in the children, growing children, it was described in 57 by Holiday and Seeger, uh, and this is based on physiological experiences that with growing uh, energy expenditure, expenditure the uh, water loss is increasing. So for an infant with 100 kilocalories per kilogram body weight, uh, energy expenditure, we calculate 100 milliliter per kilogram body weight. So it's much higher than for, for us. Right, right. So I think this rule uh, is still uh, true for the maintenance uh, uh, fluid. Of course, the high temperature, ex uh, extreme uh, circumstances are more important uh, factors to, to influence uh, the needs for fluid. But this one-to-one -one rule is true. We, we, we should accept it, I think. And uh, if I could have a question back to the, the glucose sodium co-transporter. So why is it discussed that the fluid should have some, some sodium? Uh, this is because the, the, high, the higher osmolarity of, of the fluid if, if we add sodium, or what's, what's the reason for this? Because for, from, uh, again, as a pediatrician, for me it's clear that uh, sodium in the, in the fluids is necessary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the um, the glucose uh, sodium co-transporter increases the osmolality on the basal lateral uh, surf area um, in, in, the, in, the, in the gut, um, and it's the osmotic effect. So you've got the 
the, there's usually one molecule of, of glucose being absorbed with two, maybe three um, uh, sodiums. Uh, so there's a rapid increase in the osmolality of the, the tissue in the basal lateral um, margin um, during absorption. And that seems to be the effect that drives water absorption, the, the osmotic effect there. It goes from uh, something round about normally about 400 milliosmoles, um, uh, uh, you know, studies that have looked at, up to 600 to 1,000 milliosmoles if you've got glucose uh, transport uh, along with the sodium. So it's mark, markedly hypertonic um, during absorption. Ian, you're next, and then we have <coughs> Ian, Richard, and then David. This, this sodium glucose co-transport is fine when you've got fluids, drinks alone, uh, rather than drinks and, and food. But as soon as you start to have foods with, with sodium in the foods, and, and the presence of food will stimulate a lot more intestinal secretion than your, than your drinks will. Mm -hmm. So then you get a lot of sodium in the intestinal secretion. So, so how much do you think it's, it's important to still have sodium in the drinks? Well, I, I think I said in my talk, I don't think it's particularly important for absorption. But it, it might be important for maintenance of hydration levels if an individual is losing sodium. I mean, they'll be losing it in the feces, yeah. they'll be losing it in the urine. Yeah. So it's got to be replaced. So, but it doesn't necessarily need to be there um, for, for uptake. <laughs> Has anybody done the calculations to see what the consequence of, of the population adhering to the sodium recommendations might be? Uh, not that hydration. I'm aware of. I, I really think you know, that. because if we did, well, the American target is even lower than ours, yes. but if we do get down to the sort of levels that, that, that are advised as maxima, not as averages, yeah, yeah. then the impact could be quite substantial. I, 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 I would agree. So, so the real question I wanted to ask was, was this, this is all about hydration or maintaining hydration of people in, in exercising conditions and certainly in the morning after an overnight fast when there's no, you know, you've got these rapid rates of, of water uh, uptake. But, but in a 24-hour yeah, period, most of the water uptake is not going to be that rapid um, you know, no. accelerated slope there because you're going to have food and water in the, in the whole of the intestinal tract and the absorption is going to be much slower. If, if you take a water turnover of two litres a day, say, what, what proportion of that water turnover is described by this rapid acceleration here and how much of it actually is just happening in the other 23 hours of the day? Well, undoubtedly, for most people, it's, it's a long, slow process of, of absorption. But... If you drink anything, you will get a fast level of, of emptying immediately, no matter if you're taking it with a biscuit, taking it with food. Yeah. There is an element of that, some of that liquid will quickly move out of the small intest, uh, into the small intestine, and you will get that effect there if there is absorbable nutrients present. And if you are eating, there would certainly most likely be carbohydrate and, and protein. So yes, I think that does occur. But how important is that? Probably not very important. But it is important if people are looking to rehydrate rapidly yeah. using, using beverages. Yeah. Just a comment on your point about, about salt intake. We've measured the salt losses and sweat of athletes in various situations, and, and especially in professional football players. And we see some players who can lose 10 grams of salt in a single training session, training twice a day. So that's 20 grams of salt. Now, when we, when we have gone on record as saying these people need to eat a lot of salt to maintain hydration status, to maintain fluid balance, I get abusive letters from your friend Graham McGregor who tells me that the only reason they excrete a lot of salt in the sweat is because they eat too much salt. <laughs> now, my answer to that, of course, is that if it is the case that the salt gland is dumping uh, salt, uh, the sweat gland is dumping salt, which it can do to some extent, then they should also have an enormously high sodium content in the urine because the kidney is going to be the primary vehicle. These people tend to have fairly low urinary sodium outputs in a day. So the reality is intake is struggling to keep up with loss in that situation. And if they did follow the population guidelines on sodium, they would have difficulty, if not find it impossible to, to do the exercise they do on a daily basis. So I think there are some situations where an exception to the, the salt 
guidelines are uh, absolutely still think required. We need to do the calculations for the general public, the public. when you come mm -hmm. down yeah. from 10 grams a day, which is well, actually the UK male average mm -hmm. is now 9, no. female is 8, mm -hmm. but it was 10. Yeah. And we get down to 6. Yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. That, that, Yes. That will be interesting in terms of, of hydration states. Yes. Indeed. And yes. Yeah. Yes. So yes. Yeah. Richard, I think you have the microphone next. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, you already mentioned that uh, it's very there are almost no data on the elderly that uh, and they they got sort of emptying and reabsorption. So this, um, this would be very interesting because we have elderly people taking a lot of medications mm -hmm. and most of them give some dryness in the mouth which stimulates water intake. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, most of these people shouldn't drink that much because of cardiac problems, renal problems. Right. Can we train m the, the digestive tract to slow down water in uh, air absorption? Because everything we uh, talk, and especially in, uh, in pediatric units, we try to increase the reabsorption. Can we slow down the reabsorption and stop it even, both on the apical or on the basolateral uh, receptors, whatever? Do you, are you aware of something like this? Or can we train behaviorally the, the digestive tract not to absorb that, that big amount of water? I, I, it's a very good point. I mean, the majority of studies that have looked at training the intestine is to increase absorption. Um, but presumably you can downregulate these carri carriers. If you can upregulate them, you should be able to downregulate them. But how you go about doing that, I'm not quite sure. Um, <laughs> on that. One percent of my patients, one percent of uh, people cannot drink water because their kidneys don't function. Yeah. They're on yes. dialysis. So yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's important I mean, for them. Um, and they are thirsty. <laughs> trust me. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have David next, and then Jane. Could we come back to the individual differences? You, you've emphasized mm -hmm. that there are patterns of you know, what we drink, when we drink, and how much we drink. But how much is it due to individual differences in physiology? Well, is it physiology or is it the reading habits? We don't know. I mean, but what we can say is that if you do measure an individual on a day-to-day -day basis, and we've tended to have well, quite strict guidelines, and most people do, for um, these sort of studies in that people can't have eaten, you know, it's an overnight, they're overnight fasted, yeah. um, they've got to eat the same meals in the days leading up to the, the, the study as they did the last time. So um, we're trying to uh, prevent as many disruptions to the, the study that we, that we possibly can. So to a certain extent it is um, uh, an artificial um, uh, subject that we're using because most people, well, most people do eat the same things at the same time most days. But um, it's it's we do try and control for all of these factors. So the the actual day to day variability in individuals out in the population, well, I don't think we've got any idea of. You, you you've said several times that you think that the pattern of of, of, of eating might and train the body to, to react in a certain sort of way. And, uh, but the only studies you quote is suggest that that wasn't true. Is, well, is there evidence that it is true? Yeah, I mean, we, we know that you cannot regulate uh, a carbohydrate absorption by giving people large amounts of, of uh, carbohydrate. We know we can do the same thing for fats and, and amino acids. I mean, it, the, the gut is trainable to a certain extent. So, um, uh, but people's eating habits tend to be fairly similar on a day-to-day -day basis, unless their environment changes and they come to somewhere like here to eat. Have people looked at polymorphisms or any other genetics? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, and, that, uh, and I haven't even seen any twin studies um, to, that have looked at these sort of things, um, I must admit. Sorry. Thanks. I wanted to ask you, um, what are the implications of what you've told us for beverage choice in a, in a healthy person? Um, does it matter what you choose to drink if you want to stay well hydrated? Uh, my answer to that would be it depends what you're doing and what your, your lifestyle is. Obviously, if somebody's exercising and is looking to exercise again fairly shortly, then they're going to want to get rehydrated as quickly as possible. But for the average person who's living their, their normal life, this probably doesn't really influence them at all. And 
beverage taste is probably the, the main factor that, uh, that um, determines how much a person drinks um, on a day-to-day -day basis. But we, are, we do tend to be creatures of habit, where we, we drink a cup of coffee in the morning and so on, and we drink the same, eat and drink the same things at mealtimes, and, and we have episodic intakes that are pretty regular, um, may change at the weekend, or if we go on holidays, sort of thing. But most of us have established our own um, intake o over uh, uh, long periods. And we know that with children, changing flavors, changing the look of the drink will encourage them to drink more. Um, and so presumably you, you can make the drink taste quite horrible and there'll be less of it drunk. Um, you, you could do that sort of things. But I think for the majority of people, they survive and survive quite well. I'd be interested to, to listen to the fluid intakes, the talk on the fluid intakes um, throughout the European community to see how these, these differ and in what way these differ. Uh, because obviously different communities um, have different habits, but we seem to manage to, to stay fairly well hydrated most of the time and uh, get enough energy in most of the time. Thank you. <coughs> Everybody's happy. So, what are the what are the key points you would you would emphasise then, John? Maybe. Oh, yeah. I don't know if this was asked, but I had to nip out for a comfort break. But um, Aski Yudhendrup's group has uh, done a variety of studies looking at ingesting uh, very large amounts of carbohydrate during exercise. Ingestion rates up to two point four grams of carbohydrate per, per minute, um, and. And they're looking to maximize oxidation of that carbohydrate. Um, they don't often mention gastric emptying or feelings of gastric fullness. Yeah. All those studies tend to be cycle-based studies. Um, is that a big flaw of that research? And they make a lot of recommendations suggesting carbohydrate intakes of 60 or 90 grams an hour. Yeah, um, yes. Surely but that's coming at the expense of well, I, I, I don't know if it is. Um, <laughs> I mean, it would, it would, the, the rate of fluid absorption, yes, certainly. But if you look at their studies, I mean, they're looking at oxidation rates. They're not looking at, in a lot of the studies, not performance times. There are some with performance times, but they're not looking at performance as such. Uh, they don't look at hydration status in, in these individuals who are exercising quite hard. I mean, they're specifically looking at... at um, uh, uptake of carbohydrate and the oxidation of carbohydrates. Um, and they uh, seem to give fairly large fructose um, uh, contents to, to the subjects. And I know certain people in this room here who've had bad effects of eating too much fructose or ingesting too much fructose while like, exercising. So um, it's difficult to say with Asker's stuff the uh, hydration status of the, of the subjects. But given that they're drinking uh, quite a lot and that they are exercising quite hard. I suspect that um, they don't urinate very much when they're finished, but if you looked at their hydration status, I suspect the total body water wouldn't be greatly affected by, by the, even the amounts that they're given. And of course, uh, all of those studies are cycling studies. If you were putting that in when people running, it would, be, it would be probably a lot more difficult for, for individuals to, to cope with that, yes. Yeah. Thank you, John. I just made a couple of notes of things that, for me, were some of the take-homes. Right. Um, and one of them was the fact that so many of the studies are carried out in a slightly artificial situation, i.e. overnight fasted and without the presence of food in the gut. And, of course, we have to <coughs> interpret things in the context of a normal lifestyle when food is consumed at regular intervals during the day. Most of the studies are done on healthy, young, normal males rather than females, yes. and of course there mm -hmm. may be implications of menstrual status and because we know that sex steroids influence various aspects of fluid balance, but we also need to look at older individuals, people with renal insufficiency, people with hypertension on medication, uh, other, other contexts too. We need to try to understand the individual variability in GI function. Yes. Is it genetic? Is it lifestyle? Yes. Is it something that happened in the early development? And we need to think about how all of this impacts on 
a terrible phrase, that impact on I vote, I would never say that. Mm. Uh, how it affects beverage choice and how individuals balance <laughs> the hydration with the other things that come from drinks, the energy, the, the, the vitamins and minerals you get if you consume milk or whatever. Yeah. So those for me were some of the key messages, I, would you? I, and I think there's also another one there is that we need to look at children as well. Um, I'd yeah. include those in the other populations, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I would also say that the isotopic method uh, lends itself to being used in uh, bigger populations and mixed populations. And I have looked at uptake of deuterium into the blood, but you could also obviously look at it in the breath. Yeah. Um, yeah. If it's used properly and interpreted correctly, uh, yes. because there are people in the literature who've dismissed the technique because they haven't understood How it's what, done. It's, yes. what it's telling you. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have a challenge. I mean, the ideal is to measure it throughout the day. And the problem is that if you count yeah. deuterium in each dose, then you have an accumulating yeah. background against which you are looking at the spikes. Yeah, but you can then subtract the background yeah, from it. The, but, but the other thing is that you get condensation me metabolic reactions mm. going on. Yes, so it stops being yeah. a mark of the total body water. But if you're, if you're using, if you use um, mass spectrometry, you can, you can have low levels of isotope being used. But, sure. you, but you can also switch between deuterium, tritium, tritium and oxygen-18, yeah. yeah. so yeah. You, can, mm. you can swap your tracers around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think one of the other things that probably should be looked at as well is you perhaps should be labeling the total body water yeah. with one isotope yeah. and giving another one to let's see what the, <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the various fluxes that occur. Well, we did some of those studies yeah. but never published it. Yeah. So you can go home and write up some of those studies. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, because one of the things that was absolutely striking, particularly during exercise, if you, if you give somebody a drink containing deuterium oxide during exercise and you've labelled the, the body water pool with tritium, uh, uh, sorry, if you inject tritiated water into a vein, the disappearance rate of that tritiated water during exercise is astonishing. Mm -hmm. It's down to equilibration within what, certainly less than two minutes, and in oh, some yeah, cases yes. I mean, within it's about, about 30 less seconds. than 30 seconds. Whereas at rest, yeah. it takes you 30 or 40 minutes to equilibrate. During exercise, bang, it's, it's, it's very, very fast. So you can do quite a lot with using more than one isotopic tracer. I'd have to say that the, the modeling of it is an important factor okay. as well, and getting somebody who is, who is um, really reasonably efficient and effective at uh, modeling these things uh, would be paramount.